So in the first two segments, we talked about researchers and scientists who kind of first started asking questions about how species develop and how processes on the earth exist. But now let's talk about Charles Darwin, who I think is the most famous scientist who kind of looked at this work. And he was uh, around from 1809 to 1882. He was an English naturalist who actually dropped out of medical school to become a clergyman. I always think that's a, that's a really interesting um, point and that not a lot of people know about, about Darwin. But um, the way he kind of came to be such a famous scientist was the fact that there was this captain named Robert Fitzroy, and he had a boat whose name was the Beagle. And uh, he asked Darwin to join him as a naturalist to survey species around the world. So this is just a map or an illustration of all the places the Beagle traveled. So it left from England and made its way down around the bottom tip of South America, over the Galapagos Islands, which, you know, are, are what made Darwin so famous. And then it kind of traveled around to Australia, hitting different points and different islands around that country, and then made its way down to South Africa, back to South America, and then finally back to Europe. So it was a really long, uh, really detailed trip. And um, this is where, you know, Darwin started to get a lot of his ideas and a lot of his theories. So during his travels on the Beagle, Darwin observed and collected many different specimens of, of plants and animals. And, he, and as he traveled, he noticed that there were kind of various adaptations that these plants and animals had. And um, he noticed that they inhabited many different diverse environments. So he started to notice different adaptations that these different organisms had based off of what type of environment they lived in. And Darwin's interest in the geographic distribution of species was kind of kindled by the Beagle's stop at the Galapagos Islands. And so this is where a lot of his famous research took place, or his, his observations took place. And in a minute, we'll talk about all the finches that Darwin kind of watched and observed and, and, and kind of noted differences between them and how they utilize their habitat and how they utilize their food sources. So as Darwin reassessed all that he had observed during the voyage on the Beagle, he kind of began to perceive adaptation to the environment and the origin of new species as closely related processes. So it was cool. You know, if you go to the south of South, south America and maybe you notice a bird and then you travel over to the Galapagos Islands and you notice you know, that bird looks pretty similar, but it's, it's not the same. It's, it's responding to its surroundings differently. Then he traveled to Australia and, and noticed yet another adaptation. So being able to travel the world gave him a lot of different perspectives and viewpoints that was pretty unique. But not only was that important, but his, his stop at the Galapagos Islands was especially important because he was able to note those differences within a region that was, that was fairly close to one another, but was maybe separated by just a little bit of water. So he could study different birds on different islands that were throughout the Galapagos Islands. And as an example, uh, Darwin studied finches. And here we have three different species of finches, but if you note their beak shape, and, and I'll read each of these points to you, but if you note their beak shape, beak shape, you can see that they're all fairly different. So the bird on the upper left-hand side is a cactus eater. It says the long, sharp beak of the cactus ground finch helps it tear and eat cactus flowers and pulp. Well, that would be important to have a beak that could kind of work its way into a plant that might be tough. But if that bird needs nutrients from within the cactus, it has to have a beak that allows it to access that food source. If you look on the bottom middle portion of the screen, you can see a finch that has a kind of a small pointy beak. And so this species eats insects. So it's gonna need a beak that allows it to get at insects or maybe grab insects in a way that, that it can hang on to them. So its beak is structured just, you know, a little bit differently. 
Now if you look on the right hand side of the screen, you see a seed eater. So obviously, if you're a bird that eats seeds, you're going to need a heavy duty thick beak that can break open seeds and that can get that nut out. So again, this, this picture is just illustrating how much work and how much scientific information he was able to gather just from the Galapagos Islands because of, of the different species of birds he saw on different islands throughout the Galapagos. And on the bottom, um, you just again see the immense amount of diversity that exists between birds that, that you might think are pretty similar. Now in 1844, Darwin wrote a long essay on the origin of species and on natural selection, which we'll talk about more in just a minute. But he knew what an uproar this would cause and was kind of reluctant to introduce his theory publicly. However, in June of 19, I'm sorry, of 1858, Darwin received a manuscript from somebody who had developed a theory that was similar to his own. And, um, he quickly realized if he didn't publish this work, if he didn't get it out to the public, he wasn't going to be able to take credit for all the work and all the research he had done. So he quickly uh, finished the book he called The Origin of Species and published it in 1859. Within this book that he, that he named The Origin of Species, he developed two main ideas about evolution and about how animals adapt. It was that evolution explains life's unity and diversity and that natural selection is a cause of adaptive evolution. So I want you to underline that sentence. Natural selection is a cause of evolution because I think a lot of times people confuse the two things. So in the first edition, Darwin didn't even use the word evolution until the very end, but instead he used this kind of phrase called descent with modification, which was a phrase that summarized his view of life, right? Animals kind of evolve, I'm using the word he didn't use, or descend gradually, or they modify gradually over time. So Darwin perceived that the unity we see in life we obtain from our ancestors that lived in the past. So we're related to our ancestors and we're able to kind of develop or evolve because of them. As the descendants of ancestral organisms kind of moved on or maybe spilled into new habitats over millions of years, they accumulated different adaptations or different types of modifications that allowed them to thrive or fit into their unique habitat or unique environment in very specific ways. So in the Darwinian view, you can kind of look at the history of life like a tree. So you have multiple branches from a common trunk um, to the tips of the youngest twigs that represent the diversity of living organisms. So let's take a picture of that to, to explain it further. Here is an illustration of that, that tree of life we just described. And so I think one common misconception people have about evolution is that I think we always see that, that picture of that monkey turning into a person. So it, it, that illustration almost suggests that that monkey changed into a, a caveman and then that caveman changed into the human that we know of today and that's that's not the way um, it's supposed to be taken and this illustration describes it much better so you see here maybe we're describing the kind of pedigree or the historical evolution of elephants so on the very bottom at the base of this tree you see the first ancestor that that humans know of and what happens is that as individuals or offspring of that original animal kind of um, moved on or maybe moved into new environments, new species started to branch off, right? Maybe you had one that, that moved over into a colder climate or into an area that required a different food source. So a new species kind of branched off at that point. You move further up the tree and you have another branching. 
and you move further up the tree, some more animals moved in another direction and you have responses or physiological responses that allow that animal or those, those animals that wandered off to develop traits that allow for their survival. So what is this term natural selection? Well, Darwin perceived an important connection between natural selection and the capacity of organisms to overreproduce. So right now in, in our world, we know that there are a lot of people and we're having to start dealing with how are we going to feed all the people that are in this world? How are we going to maintain different resources that we need to maintain the lifestyle we're used to living? Well, Darwin had thought of this, you know, as well in terms of other species and other organisms. But he kind of got this insight from an essay written by Thomas Malthus in 1798. And Thomas Malthus described this population growth. So Malthus contended that, that much of human suffering, such as disease, homelessness, war, hunger, was basically an inescapable consequence of human population's potential to increase faster than the food and resources available. So if you get to a point where you don't have enough food, you're going to start to have problems. You're going to start to have people starving or people fighting over food. or um, It's something that we see going on today. So natural selection is the differential success in reproduction or the unequal ability of individuals to survive and reproduce. And it results from the interaction between individuals that vary inheritable traits and their environment. Now that's kind of confusing. So I always like to kind of give a, a more familiar expression to the term natural selection. And I like to think of it as survival of the fittest, right? Let's say we have those two finches. Both of those finches are introduced, or maybe they're separated onto a new island that's formed. And there's the only food source on that island are nuts. So if we have an insect-eating finch with the finches that were equipped with beaks that would allow them to break into those nuts, natural selection is going to select the finches that have the thicker beaks, and those insect finches are going to die off because they just simply can't survive. So that's kind of what natural selection is saying. It's saying that those individuals with the traits that allow them to allow, that allow them to survive are indeed going to be the ones that that do survive and pass on their traits to future generations. So over time, natural selection can increase the adaptation of organisms to their environment. If an environment changes over time, or if individuals of a particular species, maybe they move on, um, they go someplace else, natural selection can result in allowing that animal to adapt to new conditions, sometimes giving rise to new species in the process. So again, I just want to kind of reemphasize the fact that natural selection is not the same thing as evolution. Natural selection leads to evolution and evolution exists because of natural selection. 